Welcome to the Startup Operator Podcast. I'm Roshan Karyapa. We've spoken about how gaming is such a brutally competitive space. Games have an average shelf life of anywhere between a few days to a few weeks, and majority of them don't really earn any money at all, which makes super gaming an outlier. And that's also because its co-founder and CEO, Roby John, is an outlier too. Roby has an infectious enthusiasm for games that leaves you both awed and inspired. In this conversation we spoke about the various nuances of building in the gaming space how acquisition retention and monetization works some of the levers that Roby and his team are optimizing to build the most loved games in the world this was a fascinating conversation and it will make you fall in love with building all over again so do check out this episode with Roby John of Super Gaming Hey Roby welcome to the Startup Operator podcast uh, thank you so much for making the time Thanks Roshan thanks pleasure to be here Yeah really excited to talk to you so you spent the last decade or so in in gaming right and while we now see a lot of interest we had the Nazara IPO earlier this year we have uh, Dream 11 MPL both become unicorns you are doing some fantastic work as well but i remember a time when it wasn't at all like this uh, right i mean i remember 2012 for instance uh, uh, i was at the Nascom product conclave i was a volunteer and uh, the gaming track was something that had the least number of people those were the somo lo or solo mo days right so mobile local kind of days gaming wasn't really popular you've seen this uh, from such close quarters right so what do you think about the evolution of the whole gaming space in india with the iphone and i thought was pretty sure. so you know i don't know whether i was gaming on mobile first but you know the day i got the the mobile in my hand i kind of thought that it was a differentiator was it was also what i thought of as blue ocean because you know everybody else in gaming has been doing it for console pc been around for a lot of time here is an opportunity to start at a level playing field with everybody else and that's kind of where we started so we kind of started by building games uh, right from day one uh, you know mini games small games initially it was trivia initially it was a lot of trivia games that we kind of did uh, you know i own the trademark guess the movie i made like you know i, I think my game had about 500 clones in the first year. year uh, you know i created a game called logo quiz so at one point of time you know in 20 2009 2010 i think i had like 50 of the top 100 trivia games so that's kind of where i started so compared to those days obviously you know things kind of changed drastically Uh, but you know that's also changed based on what we've kind of thought about what we've kind of grown into largely the way that i've kind of thought about it is you know if everybody i was doing a lot of custom art and kind of building out trivia from my own interest you know we had this minimalist posters that we would draw people would guess it you can see the one behind me for example uh, as an example of a minimalist poster uh, it's very apparent what that is but uh, but you know we we kind of did a lot of these things but what we saw is that people were cloning us by just taking screenshots of our art and creating a new game uh, out of that uh, and we thought that it was not very defensive uh we decided to kind of build games and what we do today essentially is like a thesis based on what we learned in the early days of just kind of growing from strength to strength uh, you know and i thought that we've now reached that point where we have a large native audience uh, in the in our own, like we were building for the world and we continue to build for the world but we now have a lot of you know native you know audiences local audiences who kind of understand what we're doing are interested in kind of building it uh, are interested in playing with all of us and that's kind of something that excites me quite a bit uh, you know alone in the space everybody now wants to be a gamer at least uh, not maybe a game developer so there's a lot more interest i'm a riot at all of my children's parties uh, they think that everybody i must i'm a star in all of these parties because they think i have the coolest <laughs> job ever so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean Yeah, if my dad uh, designed games for a living, I mean, I'd be the coolest kid in the class, right? <laughs> yeah, it's certainly a perk for sure. You know, but gaming is also a very difficult space to operate, right? I mean, I can think of so many multiple constraints uh, from a business perspective. You perhaps need the highest level of uh, skill in terms of graphic and animation design, and then you need to marry that with uh, all of the technical chops so that it can operate. with the least amount of processing power you know depending on the device bandwidth so on and so forth and then there's the fact that it's such a brutal market right i mean there's hundreds and thousands of games that don't last millions millions, millions, <laughs> millions right <laughs> exactly that don't last more than a few days now since you've right. operated in this space for so long you know if someone is considering building in this space what are some of the nuances of operating in this space and also i mean why did you choose to build in such a hyper competitive space was it like you know you just chased your passion or did you actually take a step back and think about the market and so on 
Sure, sure. So I think a couple of things, like I said, you know, I, I kind of alluded to it in my first answer. One of my big reasons why I chose to be a mobile games developer specifically is the whole evolution of touch. You know, so when when we had touchscreen phones, the ability to kind of build experiences using the touchscreen device was. was a completely new and novel opportunity and different from what anybody else had done in the space in the 25 years or so of the gaming industry before 2007 2008 and everything that was being built was being was being built from scratch so nobody bought almost any existing knowledge to it you know and that's what enabled a lot of like games you see the early successes of all games are novel touch experiences in fact our first educational games company was a company called tapcolon where we kind of taught using games where we kind of taught educational material using games we kind of thought that our competitive advantage uh, then and back then and even now is just we understand players better we we, we kind of thought that we adopted a new platform which is mobile games a lot faster than anybody else Uh, completely believed in it. The day I made my first iPhone, I've not done any any other business since this since the last thirteen fourteen years since two thousand and eight when we got our first game out. I re- I clearly remember the day. It was January twenty sixth, two thousand and nine when we got our first game out. We had nine hundred people download it, and I was in actually I was not actually not in office. I was actually in Manali, and I told my wife this that saying that hey. you know even if we had drugs to distribute to people we would not be able to distribute it to 900 people today uh, i don't think we are actually going to do anything else we are only going to kind of focus on building building for the mobile device and we thought that you know from a strategy perspective there were two or three ideas that we had Uh, the first thing was kind of figuring out how to make money and how do we kind of bring our background and experience inside of it i think like doing y combinator unlocked a lot of it for me but you know the idea was when the ipad came out we thought that my background in terms of being a teacher an educator i come from a family of educators as well my grandparents were teachers ran their own school uh, my mom is a teacher my wife is now a teacher so that's kind of a background that i had of teaching people uh, so the founders in uh, in when i first started were uh, students that I actually taught in the university of pune and i actually said that hey we are building for this you know come join me you'll never have to work anywhere else uh, you know and one of the students is now the chief operating officer of our company and he's only worked here uh, for the past 13 14 years so that's kind of been my story of what we brought to the table in terms of thinking about the competitive space and thinking about what is different in the gaming space everybody thinks about it as hit driven Uh, I actually think that the more amount of time that I've spent in it, I've got better at competing in this space. And I'll tell you why. When my first game was built, I thought that you know everybody was cloning me, and you can complain and cry, but you you essentially have no differentiation if somebody can clone you that fast. I think that's very important for everybody to understand that what's the competitive advantage that you bring into the space. And I thought that that's really what my team did really beautifully, which says that hey, my background lay lay as a backend engineer writing real time multiplayer stuff. for the 10 years before i came into gaming what we've done over a period of time is just focus on that one competitive advantage in terms of saying that hey we actually know how to build real time multiplayer items we thought of it very early uh, you know so after we did y combinator after we learned how games were built we kind of thought that hey here are various aspects of gaming business you know to learn how to be creative and how to kind of bring a quality of art to it was still a learning ongoing process but there's one differentiator that you know as super we kind of bring to the table which is both me and namneet uh, namneet singh but i chose the cto of our company worked in so to say the real time engine space for about now 20 years but maybe from from you know ever since i've written code i've mostly worked in this space and that's kind of something that we brought to all of our games and i think that for if anybody is listening and wants to kind of think about bringing to gaming something competitive that's what i've really learned from everything else is that all the big games all the big, big hits had something that the founder or the gamer brought to the table that was unique to him i remember working early at a company uh, working early with a company called backflip studios uh, and they actually had this hit game called dragon veil what i found out is jonas who's kind of the game designer of it and he and his brother growing up only drew dragons in fact his brother i think is a professional da- dragon artist i think i think that was a competitive advantage that he and his entire team had while kind of competing in that space it's tough to kind of succeed in gaming i agree millions of games that you kind of have to succeed in but i think that success in gaming is the equivalent of you know sort of say constructing a perfect storm being able to sort of say predict where the market is going to go build for that market execute 
good design you know once once you kind of got a product out being able to market it being able to optimize the product being able to whether it's for monetization whether it's for distribution then being able to acquire users successfully in that continue to kind of build a brand there these are all things that i thought we learned at various stages in our lives uh, but i thought that the more amount of time that we stayed in this space we kind of became better at each one of these things and we kind of sort of say see these things now as slow moving parts kind of understand the pieces really well so that we can now design and figure out where we want to go how we want to compete with slightly better than what we would have done when we originally started out originally we started out by just saying what were we good at that nobody else had i'd seen more movies more tv shows than anybody else in the world i you know for 3 years i think you know the between 2007 to 2010 i think i saw about 400 500 movies wow. uh, and i thought I, I i thought that that's and you know I, I'm a trivia buff uh, since school so I kind of you know bought that my bought that to the table and that really worked for me what I wanted to kind of do after that was to kind of build on new strengths as we kind of hired people also I think of we hire for those strengths you know each one of our people they actually bring new and competitive advantages to our team which we then exploit to say that hey this thing only this kind of team could have done only this person could have done uh, a lot of the art that we do for example is actually people's persona in the game uh, it's it's kind of how how our people look at themselves that's an art that only this person could have made uh, or this is a piece of code that only this team or this person could have written that's kind of what we've done in every one of our games that we bought in and I'm happy to kind of talk about it as we go along yeah no that's pretty amazing your approach is very different to at least a couple of entrepreneurs in the gaming space that i have spoken to on the podcast like we had uh, rohit bhat recently of 99 games and he said he is very clear about the fact that you know i want to pick uh, games that are lifestyle games that people will pay, play for years together and that is how we kind of evaluate games and uh, we also right. had keerthy of hit wicket as well who did this whole thesis on you know cricket is the most popular sport in india and hey i mean if we could sort of replicate that online or in a gaming form i mean it could it could become a hit right and so this is very very interesting i think i mean yours is more of a hey this is what i am uniquely positioned to sort of build and serve and so i mean this is uh, how i'd build right and uh, right. also you know uh, if uh, people are listening to this on the podcast and can't really see uh, the roby's background i mean there's a really cool poster of uh, uh, batman in the in the back <laughs> i mean <laughs> yeah so you know i'd love to delve more on the various aspects of gaming itself and super gaming specifically how you built the business but you know one question i always ask entrepreneurs who've run multiple businesses is you know what are they doing differently this time around right and uh, you know all of us have a whole laundry list of things that uh, you know we could get better at like perhaps you know prioritizing distribution or working with the right set of co-founders etc what are what are the top 3 things on your list i would have more than a top 3 list of things <laughs> uh, but essentially you know when i've kind of thought about being as a serial entrepreneur i think one of the lessons that i've actually had is to kind of build on what your strengths were from previous pieces uh, and kind of fix those open issues you know so for me uh, as a three person very technical engineering focused team i think we wanted to actually bring in the creative aspect of it we wanted to build in product management we wanted to bring in marketing uh, you know and it kind of found one guy to kind of do all of it sanket who's the chief product officer and runs product and marketing here at super you know i met him and we started super based on that uh, so it kind of took what we were already really really good at but we also bought an amazing set of people inside of super what we were trying to accomplish like the june story is better known as three guys a dog and a dream so that's kind of how we started uh, we essentially went from a three person bungalow in viman nagar to doing y combinator to kind of growing to about 25 30 people in a tough space educational games before subscriptions were invented i kind of think like we wanted to kind of not sell snake oil to a certain extent like you know this is a fix for everything so if we could actually make a game that actually could move the needle on education we did if not we didn't do it uh, so i don't think that was a good venture funded business in that sense but what we did next was kind of more interesting which says that hey i don't think we should actually do educational games because the tam on educational games is not very high it's not very big you know 4 out of 100 people it's mostly sold as chocolate covered broccoli you know very few people have a kind of made successes inside of it and most companies succeed by selling to the parent not to the child so that's kind of something that we did uh, and i think increasingly as i spent enough time in education i thought of education games is at least as a non profit i kind of thought that you know you should actually improve the outcome no matter what rather than hiding behind a subscription fee um i thought that games were an interesting enough market 
so when we kind of decided to kind of become a gaming company, our, our people had gotten really good at making games. So from a serial entrepreneur perspective, I think the one thing that we did was to kind of define what our vision and mission should be. I think at, before Super, before kind of thinking about it, we kind of said that we were trying to do almost everything. We took a step back and we said that, hey, a company should, or you know, you shouldn't create a new company unless you have that one insight, one vision, one mission that's very clear in your mind of what you're trying to achieve. That automatically attracts the right kind of co-founders. And you kind of mentioned a bunch of things, which is a bucket list of items, which is, you know, hiring the right people, you know, focusing on the right market, all of that. So I think that that vision mission initially was we only make games that people play for years. We kind of felt as a differentiator, what we brought to the table is not trying to compete on a treadmill of creativity, innovation, the hyper casual, which is hit and miss too frequently. Uh, we kind of felt like we were actually better than that. We were actually able to predict where the market is going to go to figure out where that market is. Uh, and kind of build for that space. So that's one big area from my background, which kind of came in. Like I started building a shooter before it was kind of in fashion to build a shooter game, right? And building a shooter is a fairly expensive proposition, both in terms of skills as well as money, etc. Because shooters are, the, so to say, the rocket science of the gaming business. You know, you can't, you can't, not everybody can build one. So we kind of thought that we'll actually focus on that because that combined uniquely our strengths, but also a combination of what will people play. In any platform, if you look at any evolution of gaming, uh, whether it's console, whether it's whether it's uh, you know PC or any other platform, shooting games have always been the number one category of games. Uh, the reason that they've kind of done that is because you know that's an experience that you don't don't get to do every day. Most likely, will not never do in real life. So we will live that fantasy over and over again. And we kind of felt like we were good enough to build for that. I think it's also important to be able to judge. Just because something is possible, you should also figure out the thing that hey, can you bring something unique to it. Our unique angle to it was saying that we made it accessible. We made it easy for people, especially a large generation of mobile game players in India would have never played a high-end shooter on a PC or console. Uh, so that was our first step. When we did Super, we kind of felt games are now a social network. Uh, we started so super a year before COVID, you know, and so we kind of had this thesis and that came in from when I actually launched Mask in 2019. I kind of found out that, you know, 10, 15% of my audience doesn't come to play. They come to hang out, they come to chat, they come to, you know, talk to their friends on it and being able to predict it and sit down and say that, hey, this is looking more like a social network than a game. And we kind of said that Super kind of is doing that. Super kind of thought about, thinks about games as a social network. It kind of enables those experiences where people can chat, audio chat, hang out, play with your friends. Uh, that multiplayer aspect, again, kind of combines our strengths again. Uh, so as a serial entrepreneur, all that we did was to kind of discard those things that we were not very competitive in, build on those strengths and kind of think about going essentially into harder markets. As a serial entrepreneur, you get bolder, braver. Uh, and I think that that's kind of like your, your vision should only get bolder. Your confidence should only be 10, 10x more than previous. Uh, and if you're not doing that, then you're always going to regret it. Right. Hi, you can get back to the podcast in less than a minute. But before that, remember when news wasn't in your face and out to get you? Much of what qualifies as news today are clickbaity headlines, unresearched opinions, and unnecessary speculation news used to be boring and that's why you should subscribe to the boring news at boringnews.co you get one free daily email newsletter with a fact first bullet style reporting that focuses on informing you on all things relevant the writing style gives it to you straight they don't have a voice why because in their words if you can be trusted to vote at 18 we trust you to make your own opinions as well I've subscribed to The Boring News and I find it extremely valuable. It's how I start my mornings. So go ahead and subscribe to The Boring News. That's B-O-R-I-N-G-N-E-W-S dot C-O. You won't regret it. I think once you've done a bunch of these experiments, you kind of understand, you know, what you're really good at, what you get your kicks out of. And I guess, I mean, in this current uh, stint, you are kind of doubling down on that, right? And it's also amazing that you have people that you've worked with for years and years, right? So 20 years, yeah. Me yeah. and W 20 years. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So, you know, this is uh, more than enough uh, background for us to delve into how you build a game, right? So how do you pick a category, a storyline? Take us through some of those frameworks and principles that you apply before you say that, you know what, we're going to build X, Y, or Z, and we're going to bring it to market. So one of the things that we kind of like, just to kind of break down a couple of things, one of it is going after a very large market. 
you know, for example, you know, shooters will be the number one, number two market in that space. Uh, while everybody is scared of competition in that space, I think, you know, one of the things that I kind of learned at YC and just being around some really great companies that were founded were the fact that, you know, don't be afraid. Like, you know, there's no need to be afraid of all of these because essentially everybody else is competing on an even play. Not everybody, everybody's trying to figure this out. This is still very new for a lot of people. Being able to see that and kind of be, be convinced that you also kind of can compete at that level was something that of an inner confidence that came in from doing this for 10 years. So that was really the first part. But once we actually had that confidence, the question was, what specifically do we want to do? And what specifically do we want to do? I think if you took two circles and kind of took an intersection of it, what do people want and what can you do uniquely? It would be a very small intersection, you know, and if you're building in that intersection, then I think that, you know, you're kind of you still have a chance of succeeding. That's kind of the area that we kind of thought. We said that, hey, we built shooter games for a while. Uh, we, we think we know where the shooter market is going simply because I've done more customer support for shooter players and kind of built a community of more shooter players than probably anybody else in the business. I have almost 45,000 Facebook friends uh, from the Mazgan game that I've kind of met with, worked with over the last six, seven years. So building for that community, learning about them, figuring out who they are, seeing those players is kind of something that came in as a natural strength. YC's two kind of mantras were write code and talk to users. Uh, that was the talk to users part, writing code, uh, mostly, you know, got a team that kind of figured out how to do all of these things, but also... What we wanted to set our team, the goal in terms of thinking about how do we go about selecting a game, right? You kind of said that one of the things that kind of disheartened us quite a bit in terms of saying that what are people attempting to make? And we kind of felt like everybody was attempting too low, the thing, like, and mostly with the aspect of will we succeed, will we fail? One of the things that our team kind of said is, what is the biggest thing that we can do? Uh, and I'm happy to fail at it, but what's the biggest thing that we can do? What's this big, hairy, audacious goal that nobody's attempted, but we can. And that's really something that we set our eyes on. But then we kind of systematically broke it down in terms of saying that, okay, here's why we're going to compete. Here's why we're going to do better at all of these things. And the answer to a certain extent was saying that, hey, we come from a country which, has, which is probably going to have 500, 600 million gamers. There's probably been no original content ever created for these players. You know, there's nobody uh, who kind of has the background of the experience to kind of build for this market natively, who can put his head down and say that, hey, I think this is really what will create a lot of universal appeal, both in this market, India, but also for the rest of the world. As a company, that's been our strength. We've kind of been in India India for the last 10 years, built enough in India, like you mentioned Nazara, Nitish is a good friend. Or a lot of the initial successes inside of Nazara games were all built by my team here, which is Choda Beam, Motopatlu, Foggy, a number of large successes. So we kind of, again, from those, we understood our audience better. From that audience, we were able to kind of extrapolate and say, hey, we think this is really where the market is headed. So we, when we kind of decided to build at Super, we're building a very large game, which is building on our success of Mazgan, which is a game called Indus. And the answer should probably be obvious to you in terms of saying that, hey, why Indus, where Indus, how does all of these things fit in? If I was to talk a little bit about the game and talk about what we are building, maybe we'll go into a little bit more detail. But high level, the way that we thought about it was slightly different from everybody else. We kind of said that, hey, we, we didn't want to tell the same story that you've probably heard of over and over again, which is the Greeks, Romans, Mexicans, Egyptians, Aztecs. Uh, you know, you probably only heard of the Indus Valley civilization. You done the two mandatory chapters in school and college, which is the Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa civilization, and probably seen the bad Hrithik Roshan movie. So that's kind of the, the only thing that everybody knows. But I can tell you that literally everybody knows only this one. You know, what, what you probably don't know, and I'd like to tell you a story about is, you know, hey, here's a civilization that survived for 2,500 years. At a point of time, it was it accounted for 25% of the world's trade. It was a place that people came searching for as the land of wealth, you know, whether it's called Soni Gichidia, it's whether it's called the land of milk and honey. Here's a civilization that was fairly advanced. Uh, where is all of this gone? You know, everybody knows the answer to that. But we wanted to imagine an alternate future in terms of saying that, hey, what if the civilization was so advanced that it didn't actually die? It actually flew off to a distant galaxy. 
what would it look like to kind of discover this galaxy all over again what would be to kind of tell the story all over again both as a visual treat but also with a angle and the angle that i kind of wanted to bring about it to it is what we're doing with our story of indo futurism so we kind of thought that you know the movie afro futurism did this really well i don't know whether you've seen the movie black panther and the the movie black panther actually you know told a great story for the african diaspora by inventing this fictional place called wakanda uh, and it kind of tied you know the glorious past the future the present it tied off all of these and kind of told the story it almost said being black is cool and we we kind of felt like you know that would be something that every indian would also like to kind of hear and see about uh, so we wanted to tell the story we didn't want to tell the story around the typical tropes that people have kind of created with cpr tones and holographics running all over it i won't name you know all the people who tried to do all of these things but we kind of said that hey wouldn't it be cool to kind of create some magnificent renditions of india what are things that exist in india what are things that we'd like to kind of bring into india so we kind of thought we'd actually bring all of these things in when we kind of designed these we kind of did a lot of research around indian monuments indian specifics you know so we'd actually search for every large monument in india i don't know whether you've seen any of these uh, but you know whether it's you know the this is one of my favorite ones this is actually called the jatayu earth center it's in uh, it's in koilan which is close to trivandrum my hometown so it's it's kind of there you know whether it's all the temples whether it's it's the fatehpur sikri is the the taj of the world and we wanted to tell a story that kind of bought in all of these some of the early so to say images of these kind of wanted to look like something called uncharted things that nobody's ever seen before yeah, you know and we wanted to actually tell a story that kind of made people want to go and explore all of them. so kind of bringing this kind of visual to it we kind of felt like this is something that only my team could have bought uniquely to this a lot of people would interpret this very differently but being here by by being able to kind of bring in people from various parts of india today my team consists of people literally from every part of india we have people from kanyakumari we have people from jammu we have people from nagaland mizoram meghalaya shillong assam uh, you name it we have people from there and that's kind of the story of all of us and we wanted to tell this story and tell the story in a format that generation would actually understand you know nobody's going to open a textbook and kind of see these a lot of visuals were kind of missing from all the textbooks but we wanted to tell a story where you kind of saw all of these things in the story of indo to give people hope of this is what we can be this is what we could become and that's really what our game does you know so whether that's in all the characters that we do we call this our sponsored by maneuver section <laughs> uh, so so we have a lot of content but you'll see that we kind of kept the soul of india we kind of said that hey here's our identity here's who we are but not in a poor way but kind of re- equally representing Uh, you know so to say having the responsibility of representing a, a rich culture like ours so that's kind of something that we did uh, every one of the things in our game is built internally at we have a gun we, we call it, we call ourselves a gun armory so every gun is sort of say crafted inside the office every aspect every bullet is kind of like the size of the bullet how the ballistics would work is actually crafted inside our office this is unique to us and in the sense that i would say that this is something that only a triple a studio would kind of do now because that's something that we kind of gotten good at so that's really like if you look at our team and you look at i'm, I'm showing you some stuff so that you can kind of realize is how how hard it is to kind of think about yeah. some of these things so yeah. so the idea the idea is that we don't design a gun we design the trigger fire bolt muzzle shell ejection every aspect of a gun is you kind know of like what a firing cycle would look like what the internals of a gun would look like these are all things that we kind of break down and make uh, and we kind of felt like this level of detail nobody's going to want to kind of spend time getting into and because we've actually made games before we think that all of our top players are actually interested in just this they would actually have all of these questions inside of it which kind of informs why we went the extra mile Uh, every player who's played a game every player who's played any of the battle royals would only want to play a more better version of it not a worse version of it that's really our attempt to kind of take the take it to a whole new playing field that's kind of something that we did and just to kind of round off and say that what what did we kind of do is that like i said you know gaming is a perfect storm it requires you to kind of think about all these aspects how do you bring the creative aspect how do you bring the engineering aspect to it uh, by kind of growing our team today we are 135 people uh, you know which started as three people now is 135 people who are really qualified to do all of these things who who have the ability to imagine india the indus valley civilization in a very different kind of atmosphere being aware of religion politics takes uh, kind of creating those neutral themes uh, but you know still representing like you know is that a is that a peacock or a communication tower so that's kind of something that we all kind of wanted to bring in over a period of time that's like the if the mandalorian was made in india what would it look like uh, if you kind of bought in palaces if you kind of bought in ancient ruins architecture 
it would actually look like these. This is what our island for a battle royale looks like. Uh, this is what all of our ruins would kind of look like. Uh, this is our launch poster, obviously. But kind of telling a story uh, in terms of, you know, where the story came from, where did these people come from? What is those environments? And there's a little lot more to the character design process. So there's a lot of creativity that goes inside of it, but a creativity p- with a purpose. It's it's a, it's kind of telling a story. And you'll, you'll see that, you know, it, it's all those all those things that you kind of thought about, like, you know, this is my favorite one, which is called, we call it Vahataj. Uh, <laughs> but we kind of say that if Fortnite was to be made in India, what would it look like? What would, like, you know, we call this Mech Balika. There's a little girl inside of it. <laughs> you know, this is like a modern sari. This is Morni. This is, we call them Colonel Hathi. You know, but that's kind of, that's kind of what we do, you know. That's, that's who we are. And we kind of felt like being able to, like, if you don't tell this story, who will? So that's kind of what informs our design process. That kind of is the level of detail that we like to go into when making a game. And we thought that, you know, it was too grand to even fail. Even failing looks like success here. Yeah, this is, this is just art. I mean, I, I'm just like, I'm lost for words. I mean, it's so fascinating and the, the depth up to which you have gone into, right? I mean, the level of detail is just just mind blowing, really, really mind blowing. And I know that you are probably scratching the surface here, probably showing me 1% of what, everything that has uh, <laughs> yeah, gone yeah, into it. Yeah, yeah. Early, yeah really, really, really fascinating. So that kind of brings me to my next point, right? Which is that there is a whole art and a science of building games, right? And uh, you had the whole famous uh, Zynga approach of measuring everything ad nauseum and sort of optimizing for numbers, right? And numbers and numbers. Right. And then, you know, whatever you showed me seems like such an artistic approach. It, it seems more, of, more like a right brain sort of an approach. And I right. know that no one direction is better than the other and you have to sort of balance the quantitative and qualitative aspects of things right so so i wonder how you do that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a simple quote that we kind of go by we just think that you know better a thousand people that really love you versus a million people that don't really care and we kind of felt like by kind of focusing on the qualitative aspect of it we were able to get that people to really love you and i thought that you know that's your only differentiation in the market right you know when when you have large scale analytics marketing branding campaigns essentially all going automated the love of your players is really what will keep your company going uh, and nobody nobody kind of accounts for that when thinking about strategy or thinking about any of it but one of the advantages of just kind of being in the space working with players and kind of running community for five seven years has kind of given me that confidence of having players all around the world you know who will message us and tell us like hey you know like I've been playing this game for five years, six years. Like I really enjoyed this one piece. Can you make this different or can you just give it to me? I thought that that kind of informs a lot of choices inside of it. What I felt is like, you know, sure, there's the analytical approach. But once you've kind of found something that people love, analytical approaches can actually make that better. It actually helps you deliver a better package. But if you don't focus on the customer and the customer doesn't really love you back, you've not created a product that's good enough, then even your people will not be connected to the product. So if you see the product that we built and everything that we do, it's a product, so to say, of love. It's not a product that kind of anybody would kind of just make because the analytics says we need something that appeals to 8% of the demographic. Uh, so so that's, a, that's kind of something that we kind of felt was not, not who we are. Uh, like I said, you know, it's also important in your journey as an entrepreneur to know who you are, know thyself well. And I thought that what we did in a lot of things, what we realized is there are a lot of famous founders who are not really proud of what they made. Uh, they really they really don't even tell you what, what product they make. You know, it'll be like there, but we, we kind of live our product. <laughs> <laughs> we, we kind of shout it from the mountain tops, uh, and that's kind of our identity. And I thought that I think Emerson said this, in which he said, "The woods would be silent if only those birds sang that sang best." You know, it's wrongly attributed to Emerson, but I'll kind of keep it there. Uh, but uh, he actually, he I actually thought that you know, it actually said that agar kowe bhi ho to gana chahiye. So if you're a croak, croaking, you should still croak. And I thought that that's really what great products come from. It's somebody who's not afraid to express who he is, and hopefully, there's enough people who kind of appreciate and like what they're making. That's really what we've what we've seen. Any game that we made, four four and a half star rating. But more importantly, I thought it changed people's lives. Right. Yeah, you you can't really compete against someone who's having fun, right? So good luck to your competitors in that sense. And you're also absolutely right. I think analytics can probably help you on the last mile, but really, I mean, given this whole preponderance of data, right? I think we index we overly index on the quantitative, quantifiable stuff and well, we kind I, of I think under I think- I think yeah. that's different people on a team, right? You know, mm. some people do. Really yeah, you need to have a balance of that, I suppose. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, but I've often said this to product managers, founders, right? That 20 valuable conversations with your customers or prospects will, I, I will put that over any funnel and dashboard and whatever else uh, that you can look at, right? And, you know, we, we briefly touched upon the whole shelf life of games, right? The fact that many of them don't last, you know, even days, let alone, you know, weeks and months, right? So how do you view retention? How do you engineer for retention? You know, all of the like the landscape that you're sort of crafting is so grand and the level of depth that you're going into is so much, right? How do you make sure that someone like fully explores all of this? And what are those levers that you use to kind of extend the shelf life of a game and kind of make it a lifestyle for someone? So uh, high level, you know, I think think you should understand why are people playing your game a lot before you can understand why the levers of it is if your game is unique in the sense that you know there's only something that you they can do in your game then i think that's one way of thinking about it one of the key things that we thought was really in, interesting about our game was the community that we built today the way that i understand games is that i think i think of community led games uh, so if you've got a really strong community of players playing your game, those people will come back because they don't only find the fun in your game, they also find the community around the game to kind of make your game a success. I thought that that was one very important aspect that we learned from talking to users. I want to call out my co-founder Sanket here. Sanket instilled in us so to say the discipline of just doing a lot of user research and interviews in 2019 and I almost refer to this as a pre-COVID period. We were, you know, we are in Vimannagar, which is surrounded by three colleges, uh, three Symbiosis colleges. So every other day we would actually have a bunch of Symbiosis kids hanging out in our office over pizza and us enter doing user interviews with them. And, you know, these are notes, hour long podcast notes literally done every day. Uh, and those give us valuable insights. Uh, and then we kind of build product, 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 enough product to kind of see what works, what works, what works. Still, we kind of found a product like, you know, we have a game called Silly World now, which is got, which is probably the fastest growing game that I've actually worked in now, even in 11 years, which has grown now to 11 million users. What we kind of learned from that user research was kind of finding taste and kind of figuring out what's that need or the job to be done for my product in their life. But finding retention was sort of say figuring out what's the need in their life that my product really satisfies. Are they playing casually? Are they playing socially? Are they playing, you know, for a skill level perspective? Are they playing to accomplish something? Are they playing in breaks of the game? Uh, like our, one of our topmost players, he's actually a maintenance engineer on a fabrication line. He says that he gets six hours in a day to play he, because he's not always on maintenance calls. Uh, he's actually been playing for four hours every day. Uh, I asked him, why does he play my game versus playing any of the other games? He says, because he loves the community inside of the games. Uh, you know, and we have some really insightful Facebook conversations with all of these. I think Facebook is still down for me till, till I last check as I wanted to actually show it to you as well. Uh, but also importantly, as you build this community of players, slowly you'll realize that your product, your game is becoming a service. Uh, I don't want to quickly share uh, with you one such story. So, you know, if you can see my screen, can you see my yeah. screen now? Yeah, yeah I can. So, so, you know, I, I only stopped running community in my game earlier this year. So till January, I was running community in Feb. I had a guy and, you know, he, he actually told me that, you know, Hey, Robbie, you should talk to this person because if I tell you what the story is, you'll think that I'm doping. Uh, so, so I said, okay, let me kind of message this player. So I kind of messaged this player and says that, Hey, Nicole, this is Ravi from June. This player reached out to me and said, Hey, Ravi, thank you for reaching out to me. Much appreciated. I had to get my leg amputated and I will get two different kinds of prosthetics. One for regular, one for running. I was hoping that you wouldn't mind if I use the mask gun logo and my Stormy picture on something like this. And that's a sign for a prosthetic leg with the mask gun logo on it. Uh, and that's the person uh, inside of it. And what what we, you know, and that kind of shook a lot of what I was thinking about from my game. I have a lot of players who've given me $20,000 uh, who spent an uh, insane amount of money in my game. But this one was kind of a story which was kind of, you know, very different. And this was a story that, you know, this person then reached out and we kind of discussed it again. And she kind of reached out and said that, hello, June team, I'm Nicole. I wanted to let you know there's so much for the creation of Mask Gun. There's a big story in my life or how much this game has done for me. I'm looking for to getting to know all of you and letting you know that you've saved my life in many ways. Here's a person who went through a driving accident uh, with a drunk driving accident, lost a family member, uh, lost a foot that had to be amputated and found solace in the community of players playing the game continues to be a champion playing the game today. Uh, and you know, this is 
an example for all the wrong reasons right you know uh, here's a female not associated with the kind of games that i make here's somebody who's kind of inside of the community everybody says communities are toxic then uh, shooting games are all teenagers but the point is that these stories do exist this is the reason that i make games this is what wakes me out of bed this is what keeps my team going when there's that last small bug inside of it that's what my team kind of you know this these are the stories that kind of are we know that our game is so to say a service to our players being able to deliver our best for these players is something that we do and along the way we we'll spend a lot of time thinking about like hey can i make your foot can i design uh, you know shirts for you can i design so we design the prosthetic leg like, kind of designed everything else inside of it so i think we've got masgar on somebody's body part today uh, now as a gaming company I don't think you would actually be able to ask for more even if even if there was a script I would not be able to make up a script like this one and that's and this is not one story we have many such stories this is really what comes in from kind of creating games that matter really to people so when you when you kind of do this uh, then I felt like that was a very different uh, a different calling I think of my job as almost a community service <laughs> yeah it's pretty insane yeah uh <laughs> I don't even know how to step into my next question. <laughs> yeah. But, but Russell, this is really this is really why we think that you know what we do is really valuable or important because like mm-hmm. I said you know better for a thousand people that really love you versus a million people that don't even care. Right. Right. But you do have I mean that's kind of selling yourself short right I mean you do have phenomenal reach right I mean uh, Masker has yeah. 10 million plus and you know I saw a couple of other games that are 5 million plus and so on uh, just on the play Masker store is, itself yeah Masker is 56 million users wow wow <laughs> sorry so I, I was going by the play store numbers but but for any gaming company right this whole app discovery is a is a major constraint right I mean it's a you know so, sometimes the app and play store folks act like uh, the Jaya Vijayas right I mean they act like the gatekeepers <laughs> and uh, it's a very opaque system and you you're kind of at the whims and fancies of uh, these folks right uh, apple and google and so i think many of them have uh, started exploring going direct like for instance i think npl is through the web itself right what has your experience I, I, been what sure. has worked for you specifically sure so i think i know russian one of the things for you to remember is i think of my company as existing because of apple and google because as a company we didn't exist till apple and google opened our distribution allowed us to kind of go and reach these consumers directly uh, talk to these players being able to reach out to them i think you know if i was a gaming company in the in the earlier pc ecosystem then reaching a cons- customer was almost unheard of impossible to build that relationship between all of it i still don't do anything outside of the google play and the apple app stores simply because of two reasons one is mpl or somebody else might not be there because the platform does not allow gambling it doesn't allow money in money out yeah. uh, these are it's all a skill it's a it's, it's a different a, sort of a, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it, there's a gray legality area around it that i'm best choosing to stay away from commenting on it's outside of my sort of say base Okay. from my perspective being able to reach players get that distribution of players worldwide look at if you look at our players we have players in every country in the world we have relationships with all of these players in every country in the world we have friends that we kind of created in every country in the world uh, even today i can go i can take a flight to any country and i'll have players waiting at the airport for me that's the relationship that we built across all of these countries thanks to apple and google while you can say pricey all of those things i agree but i also see that as they put a service 3 million in developer right which means that you know you're not the only one inside of it everybody wants so to say the privileged life but i think if you make a great product you'll automatically find that privilege uh, if you see our strength and see where we've got into uh, we've got into 56 million users on mask and i don't think we've spent more than like 50000 in marketing ever our history kind of says that we've kind of spent you know 50 to 100000 in marketing so that's kind of one part of it so i think what we've really done was to build a really high quality product give it away for free people invited their friends uh that's something that we kind of thought was a really good organic marketing strategy okay. so today, make something make something cool that people want basically okay. so make something give it away give it away for free and then people will invite each other but also choose the category like we kind of operate in in multiplayer games where it's a lot more fun to play with your friends uh, we kind of broke those hurdles of being able to play with your friend in one click like you could click on a button you could see what your friend is doing and you could actually play with him right then and there now these kind of serendipity moments are hard to kind of create we've created those in our games work through every one of those to kind of eliminate those bars saying that hey who, which of your friends is online what are they playing 
how can i play with them at that same time how do i organize a game with my friends without the back and forth across everything uh, now that's something that we've designed intentionally or we've kind of learned about solving problems by just working with our players our players complain say that oh i can't play with this i was not able to do this we just solved a lot of those use cases in the early days to kind of create this system so that's kind of one part of it uh, from solving the noise in the distribution just give people a reason to tell people, other people about it not in a spammy kind of way but in a like good for the game kind of way. The next thing that we also did was to kind of create a strong community of players where people come to our Discord, they come to our Facebook, they kind of come out and hang with us. We play as a developer, we stream. Cloudy is the only company that streams a game. Uh, every Friday, we kind of stream one of our games. We play with, we allow people to play with the developers. They get direct feedback to our players. We've actually had players visit us from Singapore, come to our studio and stay with us. Uh, now that's something that is something that you've got to do as a regular business as well. Now, whether you are the app store or not, that doesn't matter. Today, you know, I think our brand stands for something. Abhi naam super hai to kaam bhi super hona chahiye. You know, so, so that's kind of what our, what our brand stands for. Uh, and kind of building that brand now and we have ambitions of now being a great publisher. We've been a great developer in our previous chapter, but as super, we now want to publish and own that customer relationship where people now know us by our name. They know what our games stand for and they expect a certain bar or level of quality from all of our games. There is, it's not a single day where we have a YouTube stream who says that, oh, I know this company is making it and I know that if this company is making it, it will be good. Uh, so that's kind of something that you kind of want to do. I think at the end of the day, you know, if you own the customer, you can build any successful business out of it. I think of building any successful game out of it. Now, whether I'm building for a five-year-old or a 50-year-old, I take that same sort of say playbook to the market. Right. So if I'm hearing you right, I think you might become like a game studio, right? I mean, where people could sort of go through you and you will act like a publisher, right? I mean, as in you will choose yeah. what is aesthetically right for of, your... Yeah, at this point... Correct. At this point of time, we only publish our own games. We don't yeah. kind of enable publishing for other people. But that's because, you know, your voice should be undiluted. You should, your message should be the same. If you're just randomly publishing a bunch of games, yeah. the authenticity might be lost. So maintain the voice, like, you know, everybody should know that, oh, this company made it, so it might be good. Right, right. So, you know, well, acquisition and retention are very important, but ultimately the business has to turn over dollars or rupees, right? And can you take us through, you know, how you are monetizing your games and, you know, what has worked for you, what has not worked for you and so on? Sure, sure. So I think one one of the areas that we are still always learning is saying that how do we monetize better? There are various approaches to this. Uh, one of the approaches is just a pricing parity, which says that there might be the willingness to pay, but the means to pay might not be there, uh, which is really the ad-based approach. A lot of our games might kind of make money through ads. You know, post-COVID, I think a lot of games are making a lot more money through ads. Uh, so that's definitely accounting as part of your strategy. If you don't have an ad strategy, then you're kind of missing out. That's kind of one way of thinking about it. You're leaving money on the table. We've kind of ensured that none of our games are intrusive ads. They're only a rewarded ad unless a player willingly, voluntarily chooses to watch an ad, he will never see an ad. That's part of our user experience. Now, the next part of it is saying that, hey, how can we make you purchase something in our game better? Uh, and how do we kind of think about all of these? I actually have a very simple kind of demo around it. Uh, let me see if I can bring that up. So the way that we think about what we, what we want to do in our games is to essentially create something worthwhile. So two or three things that you want to think about first, I would say that we, we sell tangible items. You know, if you're selling a gun, you know, that's a tangible item. Yeah, you like... That's that's something that everybody really wants to buy, uh, you know, because that's something that you can't buy in real life. If you're selling a car, somebody somebody wants to buy it. If you sell a car and a gun together, definitely something that definitely something sells better inside of it. That's kind of some of our past successes. Uh, but the way that we've constructed it is slightly more thoughtful than just this approach. Uh, one is choosing, so to say, like now you want to see. I'm showing you a little bit from a live dashboard. If you're seeing it, so you'll see that I actually have 57 million users on Mastan. Uh, so so that's one. But but the other part of it is, you know, just kind of sharing with you, this is one of the toppest players in my game. Been around for a long time. You'll see that he's played about 73,000 matches. That's an insane amount of uh, wow. games that he's played. Uh, but you also see that that's because his retention, you'll see that he's actually been playing my game for over five years. But the, the part that I, I kind of think about it, what you kind of said from his, like, how do you build the retention and the acquisition theory? We said that the game will never send you a push notification, but your clan members will call you on a Sunday morning to 
play with you. <laughs> they say, hey guys, wake up, we got to play. We got our client needs to be number one. The other part of it is build high quality product. People will invite their friends. Just allow people to invite and create those loops. So you'll see here, this person invites all of his Facebook friends to play with him. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for every one player, we get about 10 plus Facebook users. So that's one. So that's one way of kind of building it. Uh, how, how do you make money? Uh, we didn't understand free to play Roshan. Like everybody, like, you know, free, free to play is this mythical beast. Very few people have actually solved it successfully. You could actually do it the Zynga way of like time management and kind of getting people to pay for time. Or you could get people to kind of pay for something valuable inside of it. What we did differently was we actually have this engine which kind of measures everything, every currency kind of did kind of done everything. What we did eventually is that we realized that all of this led to a pattern. And the pattern that I kind of see is that, you know, people spend a little bit of money, a little bit of money, but they kind of spend a large amount of money there, uh, you know, and that's in May, but you'll see that after a little while, you know, the guy spends the same amount of money in June. After a little while, you know, the guy spends the same money in July and that becomes now a recurring pattern, August, September and so on. Now, what this, what this told us is saying that, hey, what, what good free-to-play looks like is a subscription. Mm. Uh, it's a small amount of money that people will keep giving you every month. Like you pay for a Netflix. And why do you pay for a Netflix? Because you're guaranteed a certain quality of content. You're guaranteed a certain new amount of content. You're guaranteed that it will be moderated, like we meet the quality standard. Uh, so you have to kind of have that content pipeline behind you. In our case, the quality content pipeline is just new guns. Uh, so what we did was to kind of build a cloud balancing system that kind of looks at all of our guns being is able to kind of balance them in the cloud. Uh, in Mars Gun, which is a 2017, 2018 engine, we have about 30 attributes for a weapon. In Indus, we have 300. Uh, and I showed it, I showed it to you earlier, but here also we have these balancing items, but we kind of are maniacal in terms of understanding the analytics part of our business as well, by kind of balancing weapons, by saying that, Hey, if people paid for a gun, you know, they got better in every time that they paid more. So we kind of got right. So to say the price to performance ratio, mm. this is not a pay to win. The uh, ROI basically. Yeah. So you kind of, you kind of make that very clear to people. And when people see that, that you're fair, that you kind of provide value for every purchase inside of it, they're happy to invest in your game. So that's kind of something that you think about from a, just a simple first principles perspective. Uh, all of it is not rocket science. It can be figured out. It takes a little bit of time. Uh, we've been a little slow in terms of figuring out these things, but mostly because we wanted to get it right. Uh, so I think that's kind of something that over a period of time, we've now learned getting better at. Uh, but I still say that that's still like till we've kind of made the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, along with kind of satisfying our players. I wouldn't call myself an expert in this area. That's still something, so to say, of an evolving piece. But, you know, never compromise on our players to kind of make more money of them because we're trying to build a long term, you know, company that people will keep coming back to. Fantastic. So, you know, you've been in the industry for a decade and, decade and a half. You've been building games that people love. And you yourself as a founder would have changed multiple times at each stage of the business, right? And the business would have asked more out of you. The teams would have asked more out of you. And in order for you to make that next leap going forward, what is it about Roby that has to change? You know, what are some high level challenges or aspirations that you have at this point of time uh, for you to sort of leapfrog to that next level? You know, as a, as a founder, see, you always have to kind of get, get good at letting go. Uh, these are things that, you know, I'm, I'm very, I was very kind of holding on to a lot of things. I wanted to kind of be part of everything. Uh, and sometimes you might not be the best at doing all of these things as well, right? You know, you might be controlling a whole, you might be not letting a lot of people to unleash as well. So as a founder, like getting good at some areas that your team requires you to, whether that's raising capital, whether, you know, that's sometimes you have to take on different jobs, the jobs that nobody else is also doing, but also in areas you need to expand in terms of expanding yourself as a person. I think that's something that, you know, while companies grow, I think the greatest growth as a founder comes in in personal growth. You kind of are seeing the mirror every day. You're kind of, you know, and if you don't learn from those experiences, that's really the, the shortcoming of most founders. One of the things that I've been fortunate about is just having co-founders who've been able to tell it like they see it. Uh, if you, if you kind of work with people for a really long time, you know, they'll eventually hopefully get comfortable enough to tell you the things that you might not like to hear. Being open to that, improving and kind of learning from that is an ongoing process. 
Uh, but that's something that I kind of feel is still a work in progress. That's really something that I'm learning. Also, because what I'm learning is you might not know all the right answers, but the young people that we've hired also are good enough to know these answers. Uh, you know, what we are seeing, so to say, is the emergent force of the next generation. Like, and I, I think that, you know, if you kind of just look at it from a, just from a time perspective, it makes logical sense because as a 40 year old, you know, I'm an immigrant to the mobile gaming space, you know, I was not kind of born into it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the next generation now, you know, people who are in their twenties or teenagers, they've actually been growing, they've grown up with a mobile phone in their hand or, and they've grown up with games in their hand. Now, when they come and start working with us, they already know their stuff inside and out. They know exactly the experience that they want to create. Being able to trust uh, and kind of allow them to kind of create those experiences has allowed us to become a better company. At Super, uh, a lot of, lot of our teams might be led by very young people who've been brilliant and kind of come in and shaped a lot of things. Uh, they might not have a lot of like industry credit, etc. But I think for a fast moving business like games, that's actually a plus. So that's something that I've kind of learned as a founder, being able to kind of add in more co-founders uh, and not just not adding employees, but adding and working with people as co-founders uh, is something that I think we've done really well. So that's, a, that's, that's something that I think, you know, being a younger company over a period of time, as we've gotten bigger, we've actually gotten younger. We've actually got a lot more talented people, which, which scares us. Unleashing and kind of managing this talent is something that we think is a full-time job for us now. Right. Yeah. And I think that's so important, right? Because I think the average age of your users might be like way less, right? I mean, probably in the early teenagers, 20s. Yeah, teenagers. Yeah. Uh, teenagers, yeah, like the kind of games that we make, you know, we don't make any social casino. We don't make any time management. We don't make any lifestyle games. We, we kind of make a lot of games that are used by very young people. But again, two advantages, right? You know, I, I have two kids uh, in the same age group, you know, so seeing them is kind of something that I see there. And I often joke and tell people this, that I think a lot of money, a lot of people want to give us a lot more money these days because they're they're stuck at home with their kids and they now realize how much time their kids spend using playing games <laughs> right. right so you know just to close the podcast out right i mean what do you have coming up in the future and uh, yeah i mean wh what are you most optimistic about uh, going forward so, so two things that I'm really excited about in both of them are kind of multiplayer. I think, you know, the industry's kind of moved to you just playing multiplayer games every time. You don't play by yourself like you used to do earlier. But also kind of this whole evolution of streaming, the whole ecosystem coming in where you're kind of not just playing, but people also watching you, spectating you, participating in an e-sport, a true e-sport. And that's kind of what excites me because our engine and our and what we built is actually built towards that future. We've kind of thought about it three to five years before, and we're kind of building for that, you know. So every day, a thousand streamers stream a game of ours, and they kind of create their own experiences. And we build tools for these streamers within our games. Our, our games are entertainment mediums, maybe sources of livelihood for some of these people as well. That's kind of very exciting for us because finally, I think we're mainstream. <laughs> One. Um, and I also think that, you know, if you kind of want to ask for a closing statement from what we're trying to do, it's super, you know, we've set ourselves up this mission of putting India on the global gaming map. We don't want to be the best company in Viman Nagar. We don't want to be the best company in Pune or Maharashtra or even India. We want to be one of the best companies in the world that is crafting these experiences and bringing something unique to what we can bring to it. We're not trying to do what, you know, 25 other people have done, uh, but we're trying to bring to it something that everybody will play, but something that's unique only that only our team can bring. And hopefully there's a wide enough audience for it. So with Indus and what we're doing inside of Indus excites me no end. That's kind of what I'm very excited about, but I'm also excited about building what I think is India's best gaming company with a lot of the people that we actually have. We are now 135 people. Continuing to grow inside of it, you know, that's kind of the, the team and every new person that we've kind of added to the team, we've been scared at their potential. We've been scared looking at how good they are. We kind of keep joking and say that, Are you three years old, you would have been there. Yeah, you know, but that's kind of, that's kind of what excites me, right? You know, I think there's a very cool time to be in the space where everybody's kind of paying attention to what you're doing, but you're also understanding how to do it better. You don't get too many chances to do this over and over again. So hopefully we can get this right this time. Right. 
Fantastic, fantastic. This has been a fascinating, fascinating conversation. You know, I mean, as I said, this was a pretty long day, but you know, my energy levels are back up to like uh, super high right now. You know, and uh, that has a lot to do with how much energy, optimism, and enthusiasm you have for what you're doing, right? I mean, it's really, really inspiring to see the the joy of building that is very evident in you, right? So truly amazing. All the best for everything that you have coming up, and I would love to talk to you sometime soon. Hello, no, pleasure. Russian. We are right next to the airport in Pune. Uh, <laughs> so if you're ever if you're ever taking a flight in and you are waiting to get a flight, also in come by our office. We'll show 100%. you some cool stuff. We, we, Amazing. We, you know, we 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 don't only make guns. We also have a lot of real. <laughs> 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 yeah i wouldn't mind those i, I wouldn't mind those at all oh, yeah too so cool yeah, there, there are some there are some perks that come with our business <laughs> <laughs> amazing amazing yeah i mean you must be the coolest dad right i mean seriously <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah fantastic but, but, but my my wife my wife my wife often jokes and says that you know uh, she she thinks that i'm putting my children to work very early <laughs> uh, you know but i but i keep telling my i keep telling my wife this that you know my kids are in google classroom they know how to download assignments they know how to chat with their friends they know how to write documents and presentations they're doing all those things that i was doing when i was 25 years old <laughs> <laughs> so so i i don't see a reason why they can't be put to work <laughs> <laughs> yeah fantastic So thanks so much uh, Ravi I really appreciate your time and uh, yeah all the best thanks thank you so much for listening if you liked this episode then don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite platform and share this episode with all of your fellow startup operators also follow the startup operator on LinkedIn and Twitter for more updates stay safe take care and see you soon on a brand new episode of the startup operator